thanks very much for the invitation, and um, um, I'm delighted to be back in Cork, <coughs> looking out at the uh, Mardyk. Um I actually, I am from Cork, but I was a railway child, so we moved around a lot, and I had this conflict because people didn't think I was from Cork, because I, I went to secondary school in Limerick and lived in various other places, but I, I'm definitely from Cork. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when I look out there. So um, this is a talk that is, a, it's, it's a work in, in progress and it's in evolution and it's, uh, it's, it's a bit like a Frankenstein. It's got bits kind of added on, bolted on at different stages over the last while. Um, it's actually a talk that I have given a number of times, but all these other things now make it look like it's a bit all over the place. And it is, because that's where I am, you know, in terms of trying to get my head around this. So please... Um, do uh, put up with um, a thing that's going to be a bit all over the place. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to have the opportunity to work with Patricia and her group um, and, and try to move things forward uh, in terms of diabetes care in Ireland. Lots of challenges, but, but also, I think, um, lots of opportunities. So I'm going to start with my Cork uh, roots. I, I, like many of you, um, I, I'm not part of the Facebook generation, so I actually have very, very few photographs of my time um, as a student. I, I mean, people nowadays have hundreds of photographs from just single nights out, but this is the only one I could find, and it's a fantastic photograph, I, I think. Where are you, Sean? Um, so I'll let you work that out. <laughs> it, it, it was taken outside Dirty Nellies. It was taken by... Um, a GP by the name of Shanahan, who's now, I think, in Farron 4, and he was big into photography at the time. What was his first Eamon. name? Eamon Shanahan. Eamon, yeah. Thank you. Um, and interestingly, in the context of the journey I made last evening, it was taken on the way back from Galway. So I was, I, I can't sing very well, but I, I was part of the choral society because that's where the crack was, you know. And we were coming back from a choral festival. It was my first time in Galway, I reckon, um, and we stopped um, and from the front, Nulo O'Connor. So these are all GPs who should be known to you. Uh, Nulo O'Connor, Mary Favier, Cullum. And then, sadly, um, Rory Lehan, who's no longer with us. Um, and it was just fantastic, you know, th that, that time. I, I heard Freddie White on the radio last night when I was driving down. John Creedon played. Uh, and he was almost like the, the musical backdrop to that time in my life. So it was really interesting to hear him <laughs> on the journey down. But in the context of the talk that I'm about to give, um, this is a future diabetologist, hi Ivan, future diabetologist, right, surrounded by future GPs, at least one of whom is heavily involved in the IMO. That's the, <laughs> that's the connection with the talk. So, great snap though, isn't it? <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is what I took from my time as, as uh, head of school, so I just stepped down from three years as head of school in Galway. Um, and I really like this slide. Uh, what happens, what, what you're meant to be doing in roles like I'm in now, the National Clinical Lead, is providing leadership, which is, is a pointer. It's, it's this quadrant, in, in my opinion. It's stuff that is important but not urgent. What happens to you in these roles is that you get consumed <coughs> with this quadrant. This slide really resonates with me because I have spent three years trying to fight that battle of getting out of that quadrant and into that quadrant. And the reason I volunteered to give this talk and I'm delighted to be down here is that I want to try and get my head around this quadrant of where we want to be. I'm looking at the quizzical faces in the audience and this slide may not do it for you, but it does it for me. Okay, that's, this is, I think this is what it's about. It's about picking things that you can lead out on and then put up with all the others. You have to do all the other stuff. That has to be done. But, but finding one, maximum two things that you can actually identify that will make a difference. And then drive them as best you can. Try to convince people. So that's my take on management versus leadership for what it's worth. Um, so one thing you have to do is understand the organization that you're working in. And I've just come from a pretty straightforward organization in terms of its governance, right? So um, this is the academic structure in NUI Galway. Five colleges. Um, this is our college. Three schools. So down here are three schools. Medicine, nursing and midwifery, 
and health sciences. North of this is the quad, where big decisions are made. And that's the organization structure. I know it's a lot more complex than, th than what I'm making out to be, but it's actually pretty straightforward. It's helped greatly if the person at this level is a mate of yours. And when I was head of school, Tim O'Brien was dean, and that helped enormously in terms of figuring out how to get things done. So that's the organizational chart or the governance structure of the, of the organization I've just left. This, and I have to stand back. <laughs> And this is our health service. So, you know, you don't have a health service imposed on you. Your health service reflects you. That's the truth of it. Um, but, Jesus. <laughs> this, is the, our, this is the governance structure of our, of our HSE. Um, and I have no buddies at all in there. And that's only the public. Yeah, yeah, service. yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, this is our health service. Um, and this is the part of it that I am living in right now. So what's called CSPD, Clinical Strategy and Programs Division, led by a fantastic woman, Anya Carroll, who heads up all of the programs. There are 30 programs now. So this is bringing clinicians into the mix in terms of you know, management and leadership. 30 programs, um, four of which in, are, are designated as chronic disease. So diabetes, asthma, COPD, and a heart failure, and they're under health and well-being. I mean, I can't even, I tried to find a slide that would reflect that. I can't because it's, it's complex. It's a complex organization, complex structure. But just like I showed you for NUI Galway, what I need to do is figure out who are, you know, who are the decision makers and how do you get things done. And that's what we all need to do. If you want to move diabetes care forward, you need to figure out how to get things done. And there are. There are ways of actually getting it done. Um, and so this is part of our, our health service. This is, um, these are the hospital groups over here. They're, they're color coded, it's hard to see them, but um, you know, we're, we're sale to university healthcare group aligned with NUI Galway's um, academic you know, connections around the region. So that's, um, and, and that is, uh, and then these are the CHOs. This is the new term, community health uh, organizations with a chief officer and various you know this is primary care in its latest iteration okay and again just need to figure out you know how do you get things done who are the decision makers this slide is taken from um, a talk that Anya Carroll gave at, um, at, a, at a, an integrated care meeting integrated care is, is where it's at in terms of where the health service is at the moment it's especially in our area of chronic disease integrated care is the term that is being used and, and it's, the, it's the driver of, of change. So why change? This is, this is the take on it. These are some of the challenges that we face in terms of our aging population, huge prevalence of chronic disease, and then this, this you know, fragmented hospital-centric kind of um, system that we operate in. Um, these next three slides are taken from, uh, a to uh, so the, the, the HSE has formed an integrated care steering group. And the four chronic disease leads, including myself, are on it. Um, and it's chaired by Orla O'Reilly and David Handlin. Um, it has a lot of senior people from around the HSE on it. And it's, it's going to be a major driver of, of change for the next. So if you're interested in getting diabetes care to happen better in Ireland, you need to get your head around the integrated care agenda, because that's that's where it at. Now, you could be cynical, and I've been back in Ireland 10 or 11 years, and, you know, there was transformation and transformation officers for a while. But, you know, it doesn't help to be cynical, especially if you're taking on a new role. You know, this is where it's at. Integrated care is where it's at. Um, why? So these are the challenges. 50% of Irish people over 50 have at least one chronic disease, 18% have more than one. You know, the major chronic diseases will increase in prevalence, and it accounts for a lot of deaths and a lot of GP consultations and a lot of expenditure. So I know you all probably are familiar with this, but this is, this is the HSE talking. Um, this is another reason why we need to get our act together around chronic disease. Hi. Thanks. Hi, dear. Um, so another, another rationale for why you know, integrated care um, is important. Um, and a lot of this is, is perceived as care and, and stuff that could and, and should be done. In, in primary care. Um, 
interrupt me if you want to, if, if you have any questions, concerns, or um, don't agree with what I'm saying. These are borrowed slides, um, so I don't feel the same ownership of them, but this is what the HSE is thinking. Integrated care is basically where it's at, and these are the, the reasons for it. And again, <coughs> the, the, the spectrum of services. The other, the other big agenda is, is there's going to be a new framework for self-management support published in the near future. I really uh, sign up or you know, agree with that. I think <coughs> the, the issue of, of how do you manage diabetes um, well, you know, it has to have a, a self-management support and self-management education emphasis. So these are the, the spectrum of services <coughs> and what's perceived as, you know, what can be supported with good self-management and what can be delivered in the primary care setting. Okay, so that's, that's their slides that I have recently acquired and, and sort of and borrowed, as it were. Um, this is my take on it. So this is a talk I attended. Frank Vinicor is a public health doctor in the States. He was former president of the American Diabetes Association. This is the most borrowed slide in my collection. After I give talks, oftentimes people send me an email and say, could I borrow that slide that you showed? This slide and the next one. So Frank Vinokur's take on it, I think that's why it's popular. It's, it's simple. He says you either have it or you don't. This is diabetes now. If you have it, it's, recogni it's either recognized that you have it or it's not. And if it's <coughs> recognized that you have diabetes, you're either getting care for it or you're not. And if you're getting care for your diabetes is either good care or it's not. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's a pretty simple model. I, I really like it. Um, and the reason it's, it's useful when you're thinking about tackling a condition um, is that it lends itself to strategy. <coughs> so type 2 diabetes is preventable. So good luck to you. Um, but it is. We know it is. Um, you can tackle it at the level of screening and, and picking it up earlier. That, that second tier, um, and I'll reflect on that in a, in a moment. I'll reflect on each of these in my talk. Um, you can tackle it at the level of access and utilization. That's, this came from the States. I was in the States when I heard this talk, and you know, at the time there were millions of Americans who had no health insurance at all, and therefore no care other than crash and burn. Um, Obama has tried to change that, and I don't know whether it'll survive, um, but you know, Obamacare was, was attempting to get more people insured in America. And then the fourth <laughs> level is the quality of care that we deliver to those who have it, who know they have it, and who turn up. And the point that Frank Vinicor was making um, at the time I heard this talk given was that if we concentrate only on the quality of care, that level four, we're, we're not really tackling the condition. And I agree with that. However, where you are as a country or as a, as a community has to reflect where your effort is put in. To my mind, <coughs> and this may be something you don't agree with, but we're not there yet at this, at this level. We're not delivering high quality care to the people who have it, who know they have it, and who turn up for care. I find it difficult to put all our effort into one of these you know, earlier levels exclusively. Now, you're not going to do it exclusively. So I find the prevention agenda difficult to really push at the moment because we are still not <coughs> screening every, you know, re we're, not, we're still not doing the things that we should be doing. And this is the dilemma. I'd like this to be, you know, not all me talking because I'm sure you have views on it. I know Burr does. Um, <coughs> but I, I would like to, you know, with your help, you know, try and crack this one. We need to deliver good quality care to the people who have it, who know they have it and who turn up. And we also need to think about these other levels of the Vinicor model because I think they're really important. Thoughts? Or you're, you're with me so far. <laughs> you're with me so far. Okay, so this is the, 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 the nearest thing I've got to applying the Frank Vinicor model and saying how are we doing as a country. And I would encourage you to look at this. It's out of a, some kind of a think tank based in Scandinavia. Um, and I think it's a really nice piece of work. It was published in conjunction with EASD um, in, in 2014. And not many people attended, not many people heard about it, but it's a really useful report. It's basically a scorecard. Now, I don't expect you to take all this in. These are 30 countries in Europe, alphabetical, okay? These are six things, they call them sub-disciplines. There are six things that they could quantify 
in each of the 30 countries. A hard thing to do to get metrics that you can actually collect in the same way across 30 countries. Um, but they did it. They happen to resonate really strongly with Vinicor. There's prevention, there's early detection, there's the quality of the care that you're delivering, you know, attempts at outcomes, okay? How did Ireland do? What do you reckon? 30 countries. Where did we come? Well done. Did you, did you know that? I did, but I can read for that. All right, okay. Okay, sorry. You can see the slide. I, I, I put it in here. This is the ranking. So the top three were Scandinavia. Now, 20th. I think that's a shame, personally. I'm taking on this role. I think it's a shame. I think we have fantastic healthcare professionals. You know, we have, we have good, good doctors, good nurses, good, you know. We shouldn't be 20th. Why are we there? Well, that's, that's, that's the, the question. The, the top three, gold, silver, and bronze, were, were Scandinavia. The UK, when you work in the NHS, as many of us probably in the room have, all you hear about is the wants and the failings of the NHS. It's a fantastic health system. When you leave it, you realize that. Um, so they came in fourth, uh, and we're 20th, in between Slovakia and the Czech Republic. So I think we can, we can do better. Um, and these are my thoughts. This, the, rest, the next few slides, the rest of the talk, are, are um, reflections or thoughts on, on these different um, elements of the Frank Vinicor model. So I think prevention has to come from, from a community e effort. Um, to have healthcare professionals who are already stretched and not able to properly meet the needs of the people who have diabetes, know they have it and turn up. To me, channeling that in the direction of prevention, I, I have a difficulty with that. That's what they're doing in Leicester. So this is an award-winning diabetes prevention program called Let's Prevent. I presume it's aligned with walking away from diabetes. It emphasizes, um, you know, it emphasizes uh, calorie restriction with a view to weight loss and it uses pedometers on the on the um, exercise on, on the physical activity side to try and quantify um, a, a, a increased uh, calorie expenditure and they're delivering it they're using I presume Desmond trained it's very similar to Desmond but to me if we were to take this on and say this is Fantastic! Ireland's going to lead out on, on prevention. I don't. We we need to deliver structured education to those who have it, who know they have it, and who turn up well. I'm not saying 100 percent, but better than we're doing. Before we direct or redirect healthcare professionals, does that mean I don't subscribe? I, I don't agree with. Pre I completely agree with prevention, but we need to be able to do it from Healthy Ireland initiatives, or make every contact count, or just say you know do things that are out with the stretched staff who are trying to deliver the care to those who have it and know they have it. Agree or disagree? Or disagree. disagree. We should be focused on prevention. Is, is, is that what well, you... Well, I'm in general practice. Yeah. And we can do this. It's just that nobody incentivizes us to do it. Yeah. But that's why Camish comes here and his, his group in Leicester are doing so well. <coughs> but it took them nearly 10 years to build any sort of resource to do it. Yeah. But I think they're doing... It's got to be community. Yeah. It's got, it's, got to be, it's got to be grouped in. Yeah. And I, I suppose you talk for me, as you'd expect, I, I, would yeah. feel, I would feel that we should be focused on, on pre pre prevention. Yeah. If you look at we've, we've, where we are preventing heart disease. But I, at the same time, I agree with you because I would frame pre prevention quite differently. I mean, the, the, the idea of approaching patients and offering prevention is very important, but to me, that hardly registers as a prevention. But what, what I would hope is that, is that People like yourself who are in di diabetes and working to, would be say, would be would be going to government, going outside the the HSE, yeah. and say we're in serious difficulty here. We are going to drown in this unless we get a major major national system level intervention. And the sorts of systems level intervention that I would have in mind is that some some years ago when when when, when we last had money, the uh, the uh, the uh, national roads authority had a proposal. To link every every city in, in Ireland with cycle paths, yeah, and and to, to, to turn Ireland into a, a cycling country. So it's 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 
that yeah. level yeah. of But that, that, that is out with the health service. And yeah. I, so I, I am not against prevention. I, you know, the, the, the public health analogy, I'll probably get it wrong, but you know, the people who are seeing bodies coming down the river and realize that they need to go upstream. We need to go upstream, absolutely. We need to be preventing this condition. Otherwise, we're, we're just, we're never going to, you know, catch up. Burr. I think the other thing is, I don't think it's an either or situation. Yeah. I think the two things can be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. So, I just last one, yeah, we, we need to keep saying over and over again, prevention works. Yeah, like the, the deaths from heart disease and stroke have fallen by nearly seventy percent since the nineteen eighties. We couldn't imagine what it'd be like now to have the deaths rate from heart disease that we had in the seventies, and that's mostly prevented. Some, yeah, that. yeah. So we need to say pre 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 prevention works. We we'll start outside the health system, and we need to get the whole department. But I think it's people in senior HSE roles saying that often carries more, more weight. Yeah. Than well, I will say it, but I, I I will say it with the with the with the rider with the provisor that we need to focus on preventing blindness. You know, preventing amputation, preventing end stage kidney disease. You know, in the cohort that we are, and and I'm coming at it from a secondary care clinician. That's what I see. I'm, I'm on the wards this month. We've got, you know, we've got devastating complications of diabetes in Ireland. Like we have them on the wards. So, I, but I, I would like to be told what to say, Ivan and Burr. Okay, tell me what to say. Uh, sorry, just to pick up on Henry. Yeah. Is, I, I agree. It depends on where you are in the system. Yeah. So in general practice, we look after diabetes. It's not all we look after. And one of the things we've become much more alert to anyway, and need again more guidance and more resources to deal with, is the well, again uh, called pre-diabetes. So, in, I mean, our diabetes, we, we, we have a huge number of people we know are at risk of diabetes, and, and we need to be able to deal with those. To, to do something to exactly. reach out to yeah. them, yeah. But, but, so that's, that's, that's my take on prevention. I'm, not, I'm, I'm for it, but I, 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 I see it as, as needing to come, ideally, from out with the already busy and stretched services that we're trying to deliver <coughs> in the country. Um, screening and early detection is the next thing on the Frank Vinicor model. And again, this is Leicester, um, but also Cambridge. And then it's the Anglo-Danish-Dutch study. I happened when I spent five years in Cambridge, and I was involved in doing practice visits with Simon Griffin, who's the PI on addition. Fantastic study. So they, they asked the question, what if... One, one important um, methodologic... I'm, I'm realizing that I, I'm conscious of a lot of experts in the room, but you will know that screening is not about diagnosis. Screening is about treatment. Screening is about you know, asking the question, what if we pick it up earlier? Does that make a difference when we treat? And that's what they did in this study. They, they diagnosed, they went out looking for diabetes earlier and intervened um, and asked, you know, does that make a difference? They did it in, in three or four centers around um, Europe, as you see. And they presented 10-year follow-up data at, at EASD. That's where I took these slides from. <coughs> and the difficulty, so an enormous study, I mean, unbelievable, like over 300 practices and, and, and you know, in the region of 3,000 uh, participants followed with 99%, you know, data acquisition, unbelievable. Um, and the, the, the answer to the question, so what the problem was that already the quality of primary care, I think, in general practice in the countries, particularly the UK where COAF came in around the same time, was that the, 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 the practices and the patients randomized to the control arm were already getting really good care. Um, and, and so, um, you know, they were, they were already, um, they, were, they were dealing with really good quality um, diabetes care to begin with. And so the question that Simon, when he presented these slides, were the small differences in treatment. So even with the aggressive intervention, um, were the small, they only had small differences between the treatment arm and the um, what, what you would call the control arm. Were these small differences in treatment and cardiovascular risk factors over 10 years following detection associated with um, reduced cardiovascular events? Can you, can you see systolic blood pressure, marginal differences, lipids, and, and A1C? Um, and the answer is it, it wasn't statistically significantly better. But I bet if you took um, you know, another jurisdiction where the quality of the baseline diabetes care may not be as good, I think screening and early detection probably would. I'm not advocating it, just like I'm not 
pushing, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about prevention, I'm going to talk about, but I think the push for Ireland where we are should be in a, in a, in a different place in terms of what we would be really emphasizing. Um, I would say addition, uh, I, don't, I thought I had a slide of it, but it's entered the pantheon of, of incredibly you know, impressive diabetes clinical trials. I, I had a nice slide, I may have blanked it out, um, where it, it looks at addition in relation to UK PDS, Accord, you know, all of the big, big studies. It obviously comes much earlier in the, in the you know, lifetime of, of because they, they were screening and picking it up really early, but it's worth reading. It's worth looking at that slide set is available on the EASD virtual um, um, <coughs> meeting website. Um, but my, my thoughts on prevention and, on, a, on, and on, on, uh, on screening and early detection are quite similar. I'm for them, but I think that they, we need to be um, conscious of the fact that we're not yet meeting the needs of those who have diabetes and turn up for care. And, and yeah. Yeah. Think that addition, was in addition, one of these large U.S. multicenter in, 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 in intensive. No, ad addition had intensive treatment of screen detected patients with diabetes compared to usual care. The problem, as I tried to m mention, was that the usual care was very good care, and the differences they saw were m tiny, tiny, and they didn't see statistically significant. That's my take on, on addition. Um, so, thoughts on improving access and utilization. I'm going to, so, so I mentioned in the American context, it's the uninsured. Do we have people who are, we, we, our patients in Ireland are all have access to, they have, they have availability of diabetes care, yeah? They can turn up. Um, but there are two groups, and Margaret and I were at, and, and some of us were at a meeting recently in Copenhagen where I came across this term, hard to reach groups. I really like this term. Um, and I'm going to profile two hard to reach groups. This is a paper we're just resubmitting after review um, on um, a, a survey that Lorna Hurley in our group in Galway led out on investigating, um, just looking at diabetes care in nursing homes. And it is poor. Um, it's, you know, the, the participants. So these are, so Ronan O'Keeve, formerly of this parish, has helped us um, get this uh, paper in, in shape. Um, and it's a really nice piece of work. Lorna, the story of the paper is that Lorna sits in our, so she, she's a, um, one of the original community diabetes facilitators. Um, we have lots of integrated care nurses now working in that space. But Lorna heard the specialist nurses on the phone regularly to, to nursing homes helping the, the caregivers, you know, adjust insulin or whatever, and, and realized that there <coughs> probably was a deficit and then went and looked to see if there was and, and highlighted that there was. So these are the the highlights from the paper, the reported prevalence of diabetes. This is a survey of nursing homes in Galway, city and county, private and public. 14% um, um, prevalence of diabetes based on, self, on, on report from the nursing home. Um, a th only a third have staff with any diabetes education or training. Um, but 80% have residents, as you might have guessed, because they're older patients, they're on insulin. So 80% of them are on insulin and only, only you know, 30% of any any remote, you know, training in, in diabetes care. Um, the level of medical support varies widely. Um, and nursing home residents, Lorna found, have limited access to ancillary diabetes services. Is that, does that, is that similar in call? Um, I, I suppose I'm a GP in yeah. Meyer, and yeah. we were asked to take over, our practice <coughs> was asked to take over a local 40 bed nursing home recently. And we looked at the payment that we would get for it, and we said thanks, but no thanks. Mm. So that's the this, this is what happens as a result mm. you know we were in the fortunate position of saying thanks but no thanks mm. um the funding to provide care in nursing homes is abysmal mm. and this is the outcome mm. Mm. and and so you know when i think of the agenda the very broad brush agenda this is our elderly community these are the people who paid their you know their, their taxes for many many years i mean i think we are denying them basic rights yeah, if we're if we're having them, I was saying it to, to Patricia earlier. I would love to, and this might lend itself to a summer student project. But I think hip fractures. If you were to look at the actual cause of hip fractures in in nursing homes, I bet a lot of them are hypoglycemia related. People falling because they're on too much. It's not a case of too little treatment. A lot of these people are on too much treatment. And it isn't diabetes. <coughs> Maybe so, blood pressure or yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that there is a, a, a frightening polypharmacy mm. culture in nursing homes. Uh, but Dermot's 
quite right that it, you, you're talking about access. Access is very poor to <coughs> public care. We can ask somebody to have a scan or, or, or something. It can take four or five or six months to even get the investigation. And then another long time to get any access to hospital mm. because secondary care is doing too much of what should be done outside the hospital. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when I think of... Because you can only fight so many battles, right? But I, I think that this is... If you could convert... This is a Galway, you know, whatever number of nursing homes in Galway City and County. If you were to do this, and this was just the nursing home managers, that's all that Lorna... That's the, the only people she contacted. Majority private, by the way. I didn't know that. Majority of nursing homes in Galway are, are private. I was surprised at that. Like, majority by a good stretch. Um, if you were to do this at a national level, simple enough to do, bring in other stakeholders, not just the nursing home manager, bring in you know, some patients, bring in some GPs, bring in some, and, and just try and fix it. I don't know if it's the reimbursement model or, or what it is, but just try and do it better. That would be doable, I think. And, and there'll be something too, maybe you probably should talk to, to equip, because obviously they have a pretty yeah. intensive inspection regime of nursing homes, so they could incorporate <clears throat> we, were, we were advised by one of our geriatricians to send this when it was in a report format. Um, as opposed to this paper that we're submitting now, but we were su suggested to send it to HICWA. We, we, we felt that, that we, we, the nursing home managers did this for us, you know, through kind of goodwill or whatever, to send it to their, uh, you know, to their, their legislator or whatever you call HICWA, I thought would be wrong. We didn't send it to HICWA. But, but I wanted just to say that, you see, one of the problems I think of the unintended consequences yeah. of HICWA, which do a very good job in many respects, <coughs> but one of the, is exactly what you've observed, which is the number of public nursing homes this have decreased because some of them, they just can't meet the requirements <coughs> and meet the HICWA standard, so they, they go out of the business. The private sector can because they can improve their facilities and they can reinvest and more and, 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 and recoup it in fees. So that's actually why the shift is going on from public to private. That's yeah. an unintended consequence, I think, of the HICWA process. But of course, if people are really doing their job, they should be in a partnership mode with the oh, if, if they're not, we should, they sh should stop. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just pointless. A note to myself, I need to come down and give a, se a seminar here every six months. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, the other group, and this is strange, uh, you might think, but young adults with type 1 are a hard-to-reach group. Which ones? The ones that don't come to clinic. Are they, do they exist? By Jesus, they do. No, there's loads of them. And, and this is work from um, Lisa Hines, who is a PhD student at Molly Byrne, who, we just, who worked with, with us to look at non-attendance, we call it attendance, but it's actually non-attendance, and, and some of the, the, you know, the factors behind it. Really, really interesting um, piece of work. These are outcomes from all of the regions of Scotland. This is the entire population, um, and we put our Galway data in there just by, by, it happens to be at the median, because I thought it was shocking. Our average A1C, when we audited our young adult population, was 81 millimoles per mole, but actually it's about, you know, it's about right based on Scotland. So this is really poor control equals really poor outcomes at a young age. We haven't captured that in terms of eyes, kidneys and feet, but these are young people. Not only you know this intermediate outcome of A1C, but this is mortality. So this is a national diabetes mortality audit in England. And <coughs> it's a compli I, I always find it complicated to explain, but this is, um, this is age uh, in, in, in categories. Um, and then you have on the left, you have um, and um, males, no you don't, you, ha you have, yeah, you, you have males and females, right? Bottom line is young men who should not be dying have a fourfold increased risk of death, young men with type 1. Young women with type 1 diabetes have a sevenfold greater risk of death. What is going on there? Probably unrecognized or, or subclinical eating disorders playing you know, the game of, of, of not eating, managing weight by withholding insulin, yeah? And falling off the cliff into DKA, I think, is what's going on. Sevenfold increased risk. Now, there aren't many deaths. I'm conscious I'm talking to a group of epidemiologists. There aren't many deaths in that age group, but it's sevenfold higher. <clears throat> and I think that's something that we... So we have, for the past three or four years, been trying to... You know, every time I do a young adult clinic, I think... The system is broken. They're not coming, and, and therefore we're not meeting their needs, you know, and we need to reach out and do it differently. And we've been trying to do this through some HRB-funded work, and we had a KEDS award. We got a KEDS award, and we had this fantastic conference in the summer, in June, where we 
brought together you know the different strands of what we were trying to do but particularly the PPI element we've, we've really engaged with our young adults to try and hear from them <coughs> what they think and and this was <clears throat> so this was Mary Claire O'Hara who's project managing this work her father Bernard O'Hara is a recently retired president of GMIT so we did a walking tour of Galway fantastic if you're ever, if you're ever up make sure and you know, let us know and then we had a food tour of Galway which on, on that evening with the faculty there's um, it happened to be the night of one of the um, big soccer matches and ooh, ah, Paul McGrath was in town <laughs> and this is one of our young adults who wanted a photograph with Paul McGrath um, and this is the conference uh, in the quad and it was you know the just, just a, a great, but what, what I was really impressed, we had 110 people I think registered, but 10% were young adults living with type 1. And I, I, I think that's good, because we, we were able to you know, listen to their voice. So we had an expert forum, we called it, where we tried to get the experts, including young adults, to bottom out how we might do it differently. And then we had this absolutely fantastic thing, which I'd never heard of before, called a hackathon. So this is where you, because you know, technology is going to be part of the solution. Everybody you know, set that we talk to says it must involve something with, to do with technology, because that's how they communicate. So we had this, were you there, Margaret? Yeah. So we had this, um, this hackathon, and, and this is the team that won, and this is the young adult who was, so there was a young adult in each of the hackathon teams, and she said, I'm not going to check that, you know, like, I might check that, but I'll check my Snapchat. So their solution, their, their hackathon pitch was around using Snapchat to communicate in some way. Now, you might think, well, what's that about? Um, and we, 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 I subsequently heard about this thing. Any of you who've been working in the UK recently, this apparently is, is the um, hottest thing in the, well, th this is Florence, which is a very simple, bit like Snapchat, messaging system. It's SMS based and it's this person who isn't really a person who's just a protocol written into a computer but it's really taking off with you know hypertension and it's just it's nudging people between visits to do what they kind of said they would do during the visit have any of you heard of Florence Margaret has but it's we're going to try and you know look at this in our in our young adult population and see where it takes us um, okay last part is um, thoughts on improving quality of care this is the fourth level of the Frank Vinicor model. Um, and we're getting there, no question. We had a meeting recently with, um, with uh, the diabetic retina screen people. Um, and they are aware of close to, I think, 150,000 people with diabetes in Ireland who, have, you know, who they've had some contact with. And they have now photographed. So that's the, you know, the, the con initial contact. Um, and then, you know, when they go through registration and consent and photograph, they're up to about 80 or 85,000. I mean, that's, we're not there, but that's, that's impressive. Um, this is work that Marcia presented at the EDEG meeting. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's where we are in Ireland, but we don't have a denominator or it's not easy to get a denominator. So Marcia, you used tilde, I believe. And Sloan. So, you know, this is how many people have diabetes in Ireland? We don't know. And, and to my mind, that's a major deficit, a major deficiency. If you're tackling a chronic disease, I would say, I would, I would argue strongly, and I'm, I'm going to be arguing for the next three years, that we have to find out who they are. Retina screen is the closest we are to knowing, but there are other people who know or who have, you know, an idea, PCRS and, and, and others. So um, I, I think this is good work, but it's not good enough. I, I <laughs> and I mean that in that we should, because at that session, I sat in on it. I mean, the Scandinavians, I mean, they're, they're tracking this for decades, like not years, decades. And when Scotland presents, we were talking about it earlier, they have no error bars. I don't know if you've noticed that, but like you need error bars because you're, you're, you're looking at how close your data set is to the real thing. They have the real thing. So I mean, we're. I mean, we should just point to Scotland. They've been doing this, and yeah. we've had a colleague from Scotland, um, Sarah, Sarah White, yeah. recently. Yeah. Know, yeah. And if They've just done it. If they can do it, yeah. Can same do it. size, same population, presumably the same number of people with diabetes, and we are so far behind. But you know, you have to see the glass half, half, half full, as opposed to half empty. And you know, we're in a lot better place than we were 
you know, before retina screen and before this. But the, the realization, that if, if we want to tackle it, and again, it's relevant to the prevention, to the screening and everything, you have to know who has it. Because that's increasing year on year, almost certainly. This is the foot care, which I'm invested in. I know there was a paper out of um, this parish um, suggesting that um, we have a school of podiatry in, in NUI Galway, um, and the, the case for podiatrists making a difference is not strong. And that was pointed out. Well, hard to prove. Hard to prove, Claire. Yeah. Thank you. Separately. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think that, you know, if we are to get a handle on and, and prevent amputation... So this is, again, Claire's data um, showing that we have amputations happening in Ireland, a lot of them, um, and there's no trend here other than maybe up. I, I don't know. Diabetes Ireland are frustrated that the rates of amputations have not changed with, you know, with... with, with putting about a very small number of podiatrists into the mix. Um, I felt it's worth commenting, that's probably a little bit old now. Yeah, 2009. Yeah. Hopefully, there's great work being done. So well, I work in this area, Claire, and I would say if you deploy podiatrists, I would, I would think that you will inc initially... It's a bit like when breast check... I'm sure when breast check started out, the rate of breast cancer... Yeah, so there's... And certainly in the west of Ireland, there's an awful lot of people who probably should have an amputation, if we're honest. And that's a fact. You know, so this business of we throw podiatrists into the mix and suddenly the whole thing, it's not. You, you, know, you need a lot more than, than, than just podiatrists. And, and the big thing is the, the whole engagement with screening. So taking an eye photograph is fairly straightforward. Examining the foot um, is, is not as straightforward. This is work that we did in the west of Ireland. So in any practice, assuming that our work is relevant and our, is um, rep representative, and it probably is, so in any practice, you've got 100 people, about 64 of them, you can just bring them back next year. Yeah, they're low risk. Um, about 25 of them, you probably should, somebody should see them before next year. Yeah, look at their feet. And then about 10 of them will actually have active foot disease or will need, you know, to see somebody in, in, in a kind of a specialist setting. So, you know, we, we have baseline data on eyes, we have baseline data on amputations, we have baseline data on risk factors, we should just... Get on with it. And, and I even mentioned it, but this is, this is Scottish data. Over the same time period that Claire looked at, and, and there's a clear trend here. When you're out there and you're actively screening and you have a process for then you know, dealing with it, you reduce amputations. No question. So we can do it. Um, and, and this is just the school of podiatry. This is the second class. So we need to make sure that all of these young men and women are kept in Ireland, first of all, and that they're deployed somewhere in the health service. Um, and then I left it until the end, the model of care. <laughs> um, so this is the tricky one. So I started off talking about integrated care. Integrated care is where it's at. And the program at the moment is deploying, you know, fantastic uh, nurses, dietitians, podiatrists into the community, you know, to do integrated <coughs> care. Um, and I think that's good. But on, unless and until the soil is fertile and, and receptive, they're not going to grow. It's not going to happen, in, in, in my opinion. The, the, the game changer is a GP contract that recognizes and reimburses for chronic disease management. I think that Ireland will miss a trick if it writes this GP contract focusing on payment per visit. That's my opinion. I'm not an expert on it. I'm not involved in the negotiations. I have no vested interest, but I think there's a real opportunity to write this contract in a way that incentivizes. If you write it around visits, now maybe where we are now with no reimbursement, payment per visit is, is, is a good start, but it needs, you know, we, we, should be, we should be able to learn from other places that have done this differently and, and, and you know, try and incentivize good quality care. I don't know, Dermot, if, if you have thoughts on that. Um, I suppose, like, I, I would say that the, the model of care and the cycle of care are a start. Yeah. Uh, the two big issues I would have with them is that the um, the cycle of care is processes only and no quality, no quality incentive. So, you know, I, I should check the blood pressure, but actually not necessarily have to do anything about it. So somebody get a very elevated blood pressure, and that's not great. It's better than nothing, but it's not great. Um, so there are no quality incentives, and secondly, it excludes private patients. 
So all the private patients still have their incentives to keep attending the hospital sector because that is free. Um, and I think that really needs to be addressed um, to yeah. make it uniform, uh, uniformly available to all patients. Because my private patients, a lot of them will choose to attend the hospital, particularly when they retire, because you know it's cheaper than coming to see me. So, I, I hope we get it right. I hope we get a GP contract that recognises chronic disease management and prevention and all the things we've been talking about, and I hope we do it soon. Because if not, I, I, I'm, I'm positive by nature, and all these community, you know, all these integrated care nurses, fantastic. But I don't think until, until such time as we get the fundamentals sorted, and they're not at the moment, I'm, I'm concerned. Can, can I just add that? Yeah. Thought, and I know this will go down with all my GP colleagues, but one of the other things that we need to be incentivised to do is, is to invest in nursing professions, not just health uh, doctors, because yeah. again, we're not going to get there with doctors. We're just never been yeah. with doctors, and it's not the best use of medical time uh, we need. And it, uh, my, just to tell you about a little ago, that when I worked in the practice in Manchester, uh, we had 12 doctors, 12 principals in the practice, lots of trainees and so on, with a huge number of doctors and one uh, part time practice nurse. And we, year after year, we were all in the diabetes care and getting nowhere mm -hmm. until we had, and again, this seems almost incredible that we had these meetings without the nurse there, but when we had a meeting with the nurse, she said, well, of course you're not going to get there, you want me, and I'm only part-time. And following that, and again, with a lot of to and to and from, we ended up uh, starting to invest in nurses. I understand now that practice has 20 nurses, still only 12 GPs, but they're managing that. Mm -hmm. like, I, I'm in love with the UK because uh, I have a risk management for UK indemnifier and uh, so I went to GP practice doing risk assessments and most for, per GP there is between one and two nurses and between two and three administrators per GP. Um, like I was in a practice with six GPs recently. They in total <coughs> had 14 nurses, they had a practice manager, two assistant managers, a quality manager and more administrators than I could count. Mm -hmm. In my practice at the same time, of the same size, we had half a manager and three administrative assistants. So the GPs, like a lot of our time, is taken up doing clerical and nursing tasks that really need to be moved. So I, I would absolutely... Uh, mm. Not, not mm. all GPs, I want to hear that. Mm. Mm. Please. But no, just yeah. to make a point on the integrated care program, which I'm working with my HC hat on now, that is very much the vision. Like, you know, and it's well recognised that that's what's needed. <coughs> but as Sean says, and everyone says here, it's the GP contract. So sure, but, but, but in writing the contract, that needs to be written in such a way that the incentives are there to employ uh, other staff, uh, not just to pay uh, for more doctors, which we won't be able to provide. No, we'll have to But again, the, with the current contract, it certainly uh, doesn't incentivize that. No. It, 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 and, and one, of, one of the successes of Scotland and yeah. the introduction of amputations was not to do with podiatry, it was not to do with consultant um, diabetologists. It was to do with, as, as um, Dermot was saying, practice nurses, but not practice nurses as a, as a kind of second thought, but people who had independent practice and were trained. So the people with the, the, the checking of feet for sensation were the practice nurses who were doing this on a regular basis, um, because everybody had, had got an appointment. And then if you need, if somebody had a problem, you had one podiatrist for the Western Isles, say, mm -hmm who could then see them. So it, it's a matter of using people's strengths to the best. Yeah. Just, just, just one yeah. brief um, yeah. historical note. I, I, I was a chair of what was then known as the National Primary Care St Steering Group way back in the early 2000s. So far back, I can't even remember what year it was, but it was <laughs> back in the early 2000s. And this conversation is eerily Mm. It really is. Mm. The very same things that say for So we just need to, you know, I think we know what to do. I, I think we're, we're, we're making headway, but without a proper... Like, and ominously, yeah. I, I have been told that there are no negotiations mm. on the contract. Mm. That mm. it's a uh, smoke and mirrors, that there is no... Con no, I could be wrong about that. But, the, um, you know, I wouldn't hold my breath. Mm. Mm. Uh, okay. Well, just to say, I, I've heard the contract this very much, Mike. It, it's not active negotiation, but there is a process going on, and they are collecting views and, and looking for submissions on an informal basis through uh, selected people. And there will be a formal um, consultation process quite soon in the new year. Uh, admittedly, it's it's still very slow, and it's the usual Irish thing of having meetings and consultations and so on that seem interminable. But uh, it's it's not as active as we want it to be, but it's not inactive. I was I was interviewed by somebody. It bothered me that the person was I think calling from the UK. You know I thought why can't we have our our 
so I was interviewed about, you know, with views on the organisation of diabetes care with a view to informing consultation on the GP campaign. I think there is work going on within the DOH, certainly. Um, I can probably stop here. The, 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 I wanted to finish with the workforce. Um, this is out of date, but when I came back, uh, or a few years ago, I, I looked at the Irish Medical Directory. At the time, there were about 43 consultants in Ireland, diabetologists, that is, um, about 60 diabetes specialists, as far as I could make out, about 2,500 GPs. I don't know if these figures are way off, but they were the best I could come up with, about 2,000 practice nurses, and who knows how many people with diabetes. Um, but you know, it makes no sense to me to have the specialist function involved in the care, as we are, of stable type 2. There are issues of you know, um, coming up because we're free and the practice you know, has to charge and so on, but we should just figure it out. And, and, and but the integrated care nurses as a group are fantastic. I think the dietitians who are going to be appointed um, or who are being appointed at the moment are you know. But we, we need to make sure that we don't, um, that our expectations of what they can deliver is, is realistic. That, that would be my feeling. Um, and a, yeah. One of the things we need to cover that figure for practice nurses is, is very unlikely to be full time equivalents. I, I, I agree. It's probably headcount as opposed to FTE. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah. Huge Cheers. That. Thanks. Um, so, m the work that Margaret is leading around structured education, and again, this slide is out of date, um, I think is a positive feature. I don't think many countries have a national lead for diabetes structured education as we do. Um, and I think, you know, with Margaret's, through Margaret's leadership and, and drive, you know, we're, we're getting, we have a lot of, um, you know, educators on the ground who are delivering, you know, good quality uh, diabetes education. Um, and this, this is this act. Is this live now? This, this um, it is. You can actually look at your county and see where the next program is. You know that 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 is progressive. Um, I don't want to finish on a negative, but I have barriers to integrated care outlined here. Um, I'll finish on the positive, which is that in the West we've been able to. This is a resource manual. It's out of date now because we thought the model of care was going to be published. But you know it's doable. It's not rocket science. You sit down with a bunch of you know people who are working in this area. You can write down what needs to be done. We have a primary care, diabetes and primary care module, which we co-deliver now with UCC. That's what we need, more of people doing that. Um, we have Desmond, which in itself is integrating because our referrals, when I came to Galway first, about 25% were newly diagnosed. That's way down now. Why? Because GPs are comfortable and they realize you send people to Desmond and they get a good package of education. Um, we have an annual conference, um, um, which is great, and, and we need more dialogue between GPs and consultants. And we have in the past gone out this is Joe Curran's practice, or as somebody told me, Eamon O'Queeve's practice <laughs> in Connemara, quite rural, 60 miles, you know, no public service, so people have to pay money. So we, we did a virtual clinic, best, best thing, we did it over about six months, and then sadly one of Joe's partners fell off a horse, and the whole thing kind of, you know, the whole practice dynamic changed because he lost his, his partner. But it was, it was really good. You can do virtual diabetes clinics by discussing. Francis Finucane, colleague of mine in Galway, is leading out in this ECHO project, which is similar. Um, where you can just network and talk about cases. And then, I don't know too much about this, but Andrew Murphy um, in Galway was involved in this um, Irish Primary Care Research Network, which is the closest I've come to an, a, a register. We need a register. We need a handle on who has diabetes in Ireland. Three slides to finish, just promoting this international conference on integrated care. Integrated care, as I said at the beginning, is where it's at. That's in the HSE lingo. That, this is it. Fantastic conference coming to Dublin next May. Um, putting in a word for our own, this isn't. This is the one just gone. But Nuston Ireland, which is a, if you're interested in getting better at counselling and uh, empowerment and diabetes consultations, do this course. Um, and then this is uh, Margaret and I and others were at this meeting in Copenhagen recently. We're bringing this to Galway: modern approaches to diabetes self-management. Thank you for listening, and I'll come back and do this again because I've learned a lot. <laughs>